Hi, everybody. Welcome to Act Now. I'm Juliana Forlano. Act Now is Act TV's show that covers progressive activism, and we have a great show for you. Medicare just celebrated its 50th anniversary last week, and advocates gathered in D.C. to push for that expansion. We'll be talking with Alex Lawson of Social Security Works about how that's going to work. And also, we're going to be covering in our headlines section, what Cori Bush did leading a one-woman protest that kept millions of people from being evicted. Stay with us. Follow us wherever you're watching us. Coming up soon, coming up next, is the Action Rundown. Let's keep going. Last week, advocates and sane human beings celebrated the 50th anniversary of Medicare, which has, by the way, saved the lives and loves of countless human beings since its inception. Activists also held a rally in D.C. calling for the expansion of Medicare. Act TV was there, and I have some footage for you. But first, I have a message from the man who really hammered away in his last two presidential runs on how badly we need Medicare for all. Here is a statement from Senator Bernie Sanders. 56 years ago today, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed Medicare, one of the most popular and successful government programs in our nation's history, into law. Before the enactment of Medicare, as you all know, about half of our senior citizens were uninsured and roughly 35% lived in poverty. Today, everyone in America age 65 or older is guaranteed health care benefits through Medicare, regardless of income or medical condition, while the official poverty rate for seniors is now less than 9%. The program now covers more than 62 million Americans and nine in 10 beneficiaries say they are satisfied with their health care. That is the very good news. But there are also gaping holes in Medicare coverage. 75% of senior citizens who suffer from hearing loss do not have a hearing aid because of the prohibitive cost. 65% of seniors have no dental insurance and no idea how they will be able to afford to go to a dentist. More than a quarter of senior citizens in this country are missing all of their natural teeth with many unable to properly digest the food they eat, and over 70% of Americans 65 and older have untreated gum disease. Most shockingly, recent studies found a sharp increase in cancer diagnoses at 65. Why? Because too many Americans are waiting to get their Medicare coverage before seeing a doctor. That is why progressives are fighting so hard to expand Medicare in the coming budget reconciliation bill. We want to guarantee vision, hearing, and dental coverage, and we want to lower the eligibility age to 60, which would give 23 million older workers the security of knowing they can finally address illnesses and injuries and not worry about how they will pay for a doctor. And we're going to pay for it by taking on the greed of the pharmaceutical industry and finally allowing Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices. It is time to end the international disgrace of Americans paying the highest prices in the world, by far, for prescription drugs. The time is now, more than 50 years later, to fully realize the vision of what Medicare is supposed to be about. Let's work together. Let's get it done. Thank you. Ah, oh, I felt the burn, as usual. Also sending in a statement was U.S. Representative Pramia Jayapal from Washington, who, along with Debbie Dingell of Michigan, 
introduced the Medicare for All Act of 2021. Now, this is transformative legislation that would guarantee health care to everyone in America as a human right. I think we should be doing this, especially at a moment in which nearly one million people are either uninsured or underinsured during a global pandemic. Finally, the people care about this. <laughs> you have to you have to threaten them with it with a pandemic uh, in order to get people to actually want other people to have coverage. But hey, we're working toward that. Here is the video of Representative Jayapal. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal and honored to represent Washington's 7th Congressional District in the House of Representatives, where I also serve as the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today as we say happy birthday to Medicare. Medicare is one of the most popular and foundational programs in our nation's history. Since its inception in 1965, it has not only provided coverage, but also reassurance to millions of older Americans. And as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, this is a historic opportunity to build on Medicare to make a critical expansion of Medicare that will guarantee health care for millions of older adults struggling with the health and economic realities caused by our broken for-profit system. So what does that mean? Expanding Medicare would guarantee that dental, vision, and hearing are covered for the very first time. It would lower the eligibility age to cover at least 23 million additional Americans at a time when we know that a quarter of those aged 60 to 64 experience being uninsured before turning 65. And all of that would be paid for by letting Medicare negotiate directly with pharmaceutical drug companies to bring down drug prices for all Americans. That means that more is covered for more people at a lower cost. And it means lower cost for all Americans, whether they're on Medicare or not. While I'm fighting to celebrate Medicare's birthday by expanding the program, I'm also pushing to go further. Now more than ever, we need to guarantee healthcare for everyone as a human right. Healthcare with comprehensive benefits, including primary care, vision, dental, prescription drugs, mental health, long-term supports and services, reproductive care, and more. Healthcare without co-pays, private insurance premiums, deductibles, and other out-of-pocket costs. We need Medicare for all. In fact, we needed Medicare for all yesterday when nearly 100 million people were uninsured or underinsured in the richest nation on the planet when grandparents were sitting at the kitchen table cutting their pills in half, when parents were choosing between taking their kid to the doctor and paying rent, when you were putting off the care you needed and the care you deserved. As the leader of the Medicare for All Act in 2021 in the House of Representatives, I was proud to introduce it alongside more than half of the Democratic caucus including more than a dozen powerful committee chairs. This landmark legislation is endorsed by over 300 local, state, and national organizations that represent nurses, doctors, unions, and racial justice organizations. Medicare has served our seniors for decades, but today, on his 56th birthday, I think it's time to take it a step further, to guarantee healthcare for everyone. I am so proud to be in this fight with each and every one of you. Together, we can win Medicare for all. Together, we can create a just health system. And together, we can guarantee healthcare as a human right, everybody in, nobody out. Well, those were excellent videos from our fabulous pioneers and our, our representatives who are, 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 are making the way for Medicare for all.
but a little less conversation, a little more action, people. Here are some of the activists from the event that happened in D.C. I love hearing activists speak because somehow they always use words that you aren't seeing on NBC or MSNBC or really any of the BCs on corporate television. Here's a compilation video of some of the talk that went on uh, in D.C. this past week. I'm with Don Love, the executive director of Spaces in Action, and we're coming to you live from D.C. We're between the Russell and Dirksen building. Why are we here today? Because today is Medicare's birthday. It's its anniversary. And we're here to say you're older and you're wiser and you need to expand. We need to have dental, vision, and health other health insurance pieces, dental vision and hearing, and also making sure that Congress does not compromise on our backs. We need to make sure that health care is available to all people living in America. And let's start with Medicare. We need to take care of our most vulnerable, the folks who need health care that are eligible for Medicare right now. I'm Arthur Blair. Um, I, I want to say that uh, Medicare uh, anniversary is great and with my experience with Medicare is sweet and bitter. I, I am, uh, I became disabled at a very, I'd say in some sense a young age at uh, 56. And here's the problem that I have experienced with Medicare. I had to wait till I was disabled and I had to uh, wait till I was 56 to get uh, a permanent insurance. So I want to say that Medic, I support this um, expansion of Medicare that is on the board now. But I want to say this is a default position for me. It's a default position because I support Medicare for all a as a right in America because if I had um, if I had gotten Medicare for all if it was in place it would have been a prevention prevention measure and if I had was had Medicare intervention prior to becoming disabled there would have been some corrections made that would not have been permanent that I have to deal with today Health care is a right and not a privilege. And we're going to reiterate that more with our next speaker, the brother of Arthur Blair, Mr. Julian Blair. I don't understand how a body of supposedly the smartest people in the world can't understand why dental care, vision care, and hearing should be available for everyone. I don't understand why they don't understand all the numbers that we have uh, factually uh, calculated shows that it's cost efficient. I don't understand that. I don't understand the need to compromise on the health of people. I just don't. I, so I'm here to say to Congress today that we would not be tricked in the compromise. Favored of Congress. We're not going to go for it. It's reasonable, it makes sense, and it's the right of all people to have decent health care. So I'm asking you, I know you all, I'm asking anyway, that we are going to drive this message home to Congress. We will not compromise. Don't even ask us to compromise. It makes no sense. We're here not only for ourselves, we're here for the right of every American, senior, middle-aged, young, whatever you identify, identify as that senior. But uh, so we will be on your doorstep, we will be on your phone, and we will be in your face to let you know that we're here for the Medicare and medical health of all Americans. Thank you. Slash rally, also in attendance at the DC, DC rally, and um, pro it wasn't exactly a protest. It was more of a rally and a hey, we want to expand Medicare on the anniversary 
uh, of the inception of Medicare. Also in attendance was medical doctor and consultant for Social Security Works, Dr. America, who is a real doctor who just goes by Dr. America. He clearly lays out why Democrats were voted in this time in the first place. And he gives firsthand knowledge of how patients feel under this current system. I'm Dr. Sanjeev Sriram. I'm a senior advisor at Social Security Works. And yes, in activist spaces, I am Dr. America. I'm also a Maryland primary care provider. So when I say upgrade, you say Medicare. Upgrade. Medicare. Upgrade. Medicare. Upgrade. Medicare. upgrade. Medicare. My patients and families need an upgrade to Medicare, and they needed it years ago. Now, many of you know that with COVID-19, we suffered serious racial disparities with this pandemic. Black and Latino people were dying at two to three times the rate. But when you look at older members of our community, ages 55 to 64, black elders were dying at, at six times the rate of white people. Latinx people at ages 55 to 64 were dying at five times the rate of white people. Now, there are tons of things in our society that explain these inequities, but our healthcare system is a primary problem in this injustice. With, if we had expanded Medicare years ago, imagine the lives we would have saved. Just imagine the number of elders who would have been here with us had we done what we were supposed to do years ago. Now, I get it. During this pandemic, we all had to survive Trump. We all had to survive Mitch McConnell. But Democrats, we put you in power to make change, not excuses. The time has come to expand Medicare. Now, when we talk about lowering that Medicare eligibility age, I want you to know what that feels like for my patients. Right now, my patients have to describe how much they earn, where they live, where they are in their employment, where they are with their education, just to get coverage, not care, coverage. Because after they get coverage, then they get co-pays, deductibles, all the other financial obstacle courses from the insurance companies before they can get care. With expansion of Medicare, we end the nonsense. We get people the care they deserve as a basic human right. The time has come. Let's, stop making, let's start making changes. Stop making excuses. Medicare is long overdue for negotiating on prescription drug prices. Right now, a diabetic pays about $300 a vial just for the insulin. Then there are all the other pieces that they need, the test strips, the syringes, all the other equipment they need just to stay alive. It quickly becomes a huge financial hurdle. Just to put it in, in more concrete terms, imagine if you were told you had to buy a PS5 for somebody else every couple of months just so you could stay alive. That is what diabetics are doing for big pharmaceutical companies every couple of months is buying them a PS5 to stay alive. Dang. That is the ridiculousness of American health care. When Medicare negotiates those drug prices, we end that injustice and that insanity. Woo. Now, as a doctor, I can tell you your eyes, your ears, and your teeth are connected to your body. I did not have to go to medical school to tell you all this, but apparently I do have to tell Congress this. Now, I know that a lot of people want to bring up the sentimental elements of covering eyeglasses and hearing aids. Wouldn't it be great for our, for our senior, for our elders, to be able to see and hear their spouses, their kids, their grandkids? I'm not going to rain on that sentimental parade, but I do see you, fam, if you are an elder woman who is tired of seeing your husband. I get you. Maybe you don't need the eyeglasses to see him. I get it. You're done hearing your kids. You don't need the hearing aid for that. I get it. But what we need those hearing aids and eyeglasses for is for injury prevention. A slight bit of hearing loss triples your risk of falling down. Hearing aids, vision, these things are what connect us to the real world. Just a little bit of vision loss, a little bit of hearing loss, and your risk of dementia goes up by 50%. These things are not luxury items. Your teeth are not luxury items. Our, 
among our elders, black and Latinx people suffer two to three times as many cavities as white people because we keep using racial capitalism to do dental work. We can do this. We can do this. We can make Medicare cover dental care when we start making changes and we stop making excuses. All the excuses are up. Nobody cares about that filibuster. The filibuster is for busters. <laughs> Democrats, it's time to start making changes, stop making excuses. Let's expand Medicare. We are here to help you. We're going to expand Medicare. We're going to do it. We're going to add vision, hearing, dental, and an out-of-pocket cap. And you know who hates that? Big insurance. We're going to beat them. We're going to lower the age of Medicare to 60. You know who hates that? Big hospital. And we're going to beat them. And we're going to give Medicare the ability to negotiate drug prices. And who hates that? And we're going to beat them because we've got the people. They've got the money. They're arrayed. They're probably still let in the building while we're not let in the building. They're probably allowed to carry their signs around, which we're not allowed to do. <laughs> but what we are able to do is tell our elected officials that money doesn't vote. People vote. And if you compromise on our backs, it's the closest, it's the shortest path to the unemployment line for you. We are sick and tired of hearing excuses about why now is not the moment. Expanding Medicare is the compromise. This is the compromise. We've compromised as much as we will. No more compromise. We want everything. We're going to add vision. We're going to add hearing. We're going to add dental an out-of-pocket cap, we're going to lower the age of Medicare to 60, we're going to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices, we're going to take on the industry players, and we're going to win. <laughs> Thank you so much to everybody who makes this possible. This right here contains a selection of the more than 130,000 Americans who have signed this petition to expand Medicare. We're here to deliver it. I'm going to walk it across the street into the building. I have to figure out how to get in because it's all closed right now. Uh, but I'm going to do it. We're going to make sure that our voices are heard. I also already emailed it to them so they do know. Uh, and I'm sure that all of the Capitol Police who are around are also very aware that we're here. Uh, but just in case, I ask everyone at home, do not let up. Call your senators. Tell them right now. No compromising on the people. It's time that industry, that Wall Street, that pharma, hospital, and big insurance took the loss, not the people. We're sick and tired of waiting, and we're not going to do it anymore. Thank you so much. And who you just saw speaking was Alex Lawson, executive director of Social Security Works. I loved how he talked about who is standing in the way of expanding Medicare and what Social Security advocates expect to accomplish in the coming days. We're going to be able to talk to him today right here on this program in just a minute during our interview segment. So stay tuned for that. You're watching Act TV. I'm Juliana Forlano. Alex Lawson, you are joining me today, coming hot off the rally last week to press for Medicare expansion done on the anniversary, uh, 50th anniversary of Medicare. Thanks for joining me on the program today. Thanks for having me, of course. Uh, it was the 56th birthday. Oh. Um, Medicare is oh. getting up there, almost qualifies for Medicare itself. And if we I'm get our way, uh, it'll be sooner. 
I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I know it's corny, one. but you know. Uh, Alex, where are we in terms of being able to get that Medicare expansion? Um, so it's it's a little bit complicated, but uh, the short answer is extremely close. Mm. Uh, we're closer than we've ever been before, ever. Um, technically, what's going on right now is there's this bipartisan infrastructure thing, uh, which was acronym the BIF, uh, which I think is a pretty good acronym for it. Um, uh, now it's acronym I actually did stand up with actual Biff, that guy <laughs> Biff who played Biff yeah. on coming to the yeah. And I'm that, like, aren't that, you Biff? Anyway, sorry, that's a whole nother. <laughs> Go ahead. But that's it. <laughs> it, it's, it. It really vibed Biff um, because the Republicans pretending to act in good faith is always something that mm -hmm. I watch with uh, the same drama that I watch a Peanuts strip when Lucy is telling uh, Charlie Brown that she's not going to pull the football away this time. And I'm like, huh. oh, I wonder what the final frame is going to be. Oh, no, I don't because it's always the same. So now it's the bib um, and it is proceeding right now on the Senate floor. Uh, they are uh, offering amendments right now. And uh, what has to happen is 10 Republican senators have to stand with the uh, 50 Democratic senators and close debate on that. And then it will pass the Senate and that opens up the space for the Senate Democrats to uh, start the budget resolution process, which is a $3.5 trillion um, package that we shorthand the reconciliation package. And in that are all of the expansions that we're talking about. It still plays out. You still have months where you have to fill in the details. But next week is sort of uh, the crucible. And there's many things that can go wrong. Lindsey Graham just uh, was diagnosed with COVID. Um, ah. He was on a, a house, uh, a yacht party on, um, on um, what's his name from West Virginia on Senator Manchin's Manchin. yacht. Yeah, that, that was disturbing to hear that that's where he got it because mm -hmm. they're hanging but, out, I guess. And Manchin is supposed I, to be a Democrat. Anyway, well, I guess you can hang out across parties, but it seems a little sketchy that he votes in line with with grant anyway go ahead that was the bipartisan so the, like the people who are are running the biff were on the yacht uh where um yeah, lindsey graham had covid so other of them come down with covid uh and you very quickly lose votes uh that are necessary to move this thing along um, so there's the distinct possibility that the bipartisan infrastructure package does not work uh and it falls apart i would mm -hmm. actually put money on that because it's still depends on finding 10 republicans and so like the thing to watch is can they find 10 republicans to close debate um and then uh sort of regardless either the bipartisan thing uh succeeds and then the budget resolution goes forward or the bipartisan thing fails and then the budget resolution goes forward um and that is the good news is that uh, both leader schumer in the Senate and Speaker Pelosi in the House have been adamant that the two things have to pass together. There's no way that the bipartisan thing can pass uh, on its own. And they're not sort of doing that out of the goodness of their heart. In the House, there is a absolute unbreakable wall, a block of votes who have made it absolutely clear that they will kill uh, the bipartisan package if it tries to move without the $3.5 trillion reconciliation package that has all of the uh, good stuff in it. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. We still have to fight out some of the particulars. Uh, for example, we want to lower the age to 60. And there's already this sort of elite talk happening in DC where they're like, oh, well, you got to understand that's very complicated. <laughs> Stop. I don't have to understand anything. How hard is it? No, it's not. <laughs> Exactly. We created Medicare in a year. I'm sorry. I'm a student of the New Deal. I know how hard these things are. Uh, we are the United States of America. Once we put our minds to it, we can do these things. What, what uh, so, happened to doing hard stuff? Uh, just because it's hard doesn't mean we don't do it when it's uh, right. Or as uh, President Kennedy said, you know, we will go to the moon and do the other things, not because they are easy, <laughs> but because they are hard. Um, so these are... <laughs> 
and go the to the moon thing. and do the other things. Do the like other give things. people health care. Okay. If they can go to the moon, you know. Alex, what effect has the fact that Biden kind of dropped some of the care economy uh, asks or whatever he w- wants um, from the bill? I mean, I, to me, I saw covering people's in-home care as an expen- expansion of Medicare. Um, so it's, it's the... It's complicated is an annoying thing to say, but it is complicated because nothing has actually fallen out of Mm -hmm. any of the packages. Uh, It's we've heard various levels go up and down. So home and community based services that you're talking about was at 400 billion. And then they said, oh, no, it's at 150 billion. And then we were like, no at 400 billion and they're like okay it's somewhere in between 200 and 400 billion that's how dc it's works. so impossible to follow i have to say it because is. a last map i saw of you know it was like the pie graph that i think it was the new york times put up saying this is the current negotiation had that at like nothing mm-hmm. and the thing is uh it's on purpose right the the inscrutableness if that's the word of uh, DC is on purpose. It means that you have to be an expert to follow along, which means that you basically lobbyists and industry are better suited than the people. Um, But I can sort of tell you how it goes, which is in the beginning, they called it the American Families Plan and the American Jobs Plan. Uh, And you had sort of the breakdown was hard infrastructure and then care infrastructure or human infrastructure. And the Republicans were like, we don't want any of the long-term care stuff. None of that care, even though like seriously, people should Google the definition of infrastructure and be like uh, a long-term care system is absolutely infrastructure. But so a bunch of that stuff uh, that the Republicans called hard infrastructure got moved over into the bipartisan package. And then the rest stayed in this reconciliation package and the breakdown between Um, families and jobs plan was sort of mushed together. And then a lot of coverage came out that said that the bipartisan package was the only thing. And so they were like, oh, the left has lost on all of its priorities because none of this stuff is in there. And that's just actually a misreading of what's going on. We could lose. We absolutely could lose. But people should follow it correctly. $3.5 $3.5 trillion is at play right now. That's the largest amount of money uh, that anyone has ever seen move in investments in all sorts of things. It has progressive priorities from A to Z in it. Um, the $1 trillion package on the bipartisan, which to be super uh, repetitive, The Republicans don't want any of it, right? Mitch McConnell wants all of it to fail so that then they can blame uh, Biden and they can and take uh, the House, the Senate and then the White House back. So it's all this this game where they're trying to box the the Democrats in. And what they're really hoping is that some senator dies. That's their biggest (laughs) They're waiting. Yes. And I, I fought for Obamacare. So I was there when Ted Kennedy died and the whole thing almost went kaput. When we lost Ted Kennedy's seat in the Senate. Uh, Uh, Yes. And uh, (laughs) so like that's literally when it's a razor's edge, when it's 50-50, what they're just trying to do is drag it into the August recess uh, so that they- And hope somebody gets COVID on vacation. Yep. And and that's where we are. But we have this block and progressives should be proud of this. We have never had a stronger block of champions in the House saying, we will not allow the bipartisan thing to be all that we get, right? And that's what the the Republicans want nothing. If they can't get nothing, they want as little as possible. And the progressives are saying, we're not falling for that again. And the setup is actually such that the progressives can block the entire thing. Um, And again, when it comes to like maintaining a block, uh, you only, it's such a small majority, you don't even need that many House members, but you need to have like 10 times as many House members as you need to to block it because the money and, and pressure on them is going to be so big that you'll lose a few of them. And we've got like 30 times the number that we need. So it is a insurmountable obstacle uh, to people who want to just do the bare minimum. 
So I, not rose-colored glasses, because I've done been doing this for a long time, um, not rose-colored glasses, but I would say we are in a better position than we've ever been. Um, the setup that we have, and we just need to just push this through. We're at the goal line. So there, the industry is as arrayed as they'll ever be. They've got all of their money out. They're hitting every uh, door that they can. Uh, that's why we did that petition delivery uh, and really reminded electeds that, you know, we have the people. They might have the money, but we've still got the people and the people are clear uh, on what we want. Actually, that gets right into the next question. What, have you seen a shift in public opinion toward people really wanting Medicare expansion, specifically people on the right who have been bombarded by uh, austerity talking points for the last 30 years? So uh, the I know you know this, but uh, our polling has never moved. The American people have always wanted expansion. Um, the American people uh, want, you know. I did not is... know that, actually. I think that that oh, most, yeah. we... there's this like propaganda around, oh, well, Republicans don't want it for some now, reason. The, um, the, the truth is that uh, you, consistently what we find is that expanding Social Security off the charts, expanding Medicare benefits, so adding vision, hearing, dental, out-of-pocket cap, adding long-term care, um, extraordinarily popular uh, bipartisanly. Lowering the Medicare age is much more popular with Democrats than it is with uh, Republicans, but independents uh, still support it uh, at high levels. So it, it, it is very popular. Allowing Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices is like, three, you can't get higher than that. And that is across the board, um, and so what you're, the propaganda that you actually see is the Republicans pretend that it's the Democrats who aren't delivering on these things, right? The, de the Republicans uh, kneecap the mailman and then complain that the mail is late. That's their right. MO. So they set up the failure and then they run on the fact that the Democrats can't get anything done. So and when you then go when out, they get in there, they do nothing. They do or nothing. Worse. Well, they, they undermine they do, it. Yeah, they do what they always do, which is just uh, take our money and give it away to uh, their rich friends, their cousins, and you know, their 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 uh, the people who who call the tune that they dance to on Wall Street. Um, that's what they do. The Republicans do that all the time. It's Wall Street, extractive industries. Um, but what we know is outside of D.C., these po policies are incredibly popular. Uh, and so that's why we want to take this to them and force them uh, to take votes on this, force them to vote against all of these incredibly popular policies uh, and let people know squarely who is on whose side. Well, it's a great idea. What can people who are watching do to support the work of Social Security Works? Um, right now, what we need to do is just punch this across the goal line. Uh, this is the hardest part, but we, this is a sports analogy, sorry, but uh, you know, we're close enough that we're probably gonna get something. Um, but what, so what usually happens with power is they want us to settle mm. for something. Um, and I want everybody to call your senators and tell them we want everything. Um, everything that's on offer right now is the compromise. Uh, adding vision, hearing, dental, and out-of-pocket cap, uh, allowing Medicare to negotiate, lowering the age to 60, um, creating a long-term care system in this country uh, with home and community-based services. That is the compromise. We're not going to compromise further from that. We're going to get all of that, and we will hold people accountable if they don't fight to the end on our priorities. Uh, and every Democratic senator needs to hear that from you right now. If your senators are Republican, call um, uh, Leader Schumer's office. He is the majority leader, uh, and he therefore represents the entire caucus. And you should tell him, we want it all. We want all of it. We want vision, hearing, dental, and out-of-pocket cap, prescription drug price negotiation, and long-term care. Uh, we are sick and tired of us having to be reasonable and compromise. We already compromised. It is a uh, compromise. It's not exactly. Medicare for all, right? That's the that's, compromise. We'll that's take the this compromise. right now.
Uh, and we're, we're going to be very reasonable about this. People are dying because of this. Uh, as Dr. Sanjeev Sriram, also known as Dr. America, uh, points out, the ludicrousness of pretending that eyes, ears, and teeth are not part of our bodies uh, is That's only crazy. possible in our system of uh, quote unquote healthcare, which is just a wealth extraction system and not a healthcare system. So we want to shorten the path to Medicare for all. And that's what we're doing by expanding and empowering traditional Medicare. And at the same time, diminishing our opposition in big pharma, big insurance and big hospital. That's what we're fighting for. Every Democrat needs to get on board with that or they're gonna find themselves uh, at odds with their, with their constituents. Alex Lawson, Executive Director of Social Security Works. You can follow Alex on the, well, follow Social Security Works on the Twitters at SS Works. Thanks so much for joining us and for all the work you do to keep this society humane and sane. Thanks, everybody. Coming up next, the headlines. All right, welcome to the headlines. This is the part of the show where we discuss what's happening in progressive activism. And have I got a doozy for you. One formerly homeless woman saved millions of people from being kicked out of their homes for now by taking a stand or rather a seat on the Capitol steps. Representative Cori Bush started sleeping outside on the Capitol steps Friday when Congress adjourned without extending the moratorium on evictions that is keeping millions of Americans from suddenly becoming homeless. Over the weekend, Representative Bush was joined by AOC, as well as Representative Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts, Jamal Bowman of New York, and Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. Congress let the moratorium lapse on Sunday as they headed out for their August recess, also known as vacay. They went on vacation while the people they represent were getting their belongings tossed into the yard. I mean, was this the ultimate let them eat cake while I party with Obama in the vineyard moment or what? Or did they not realize that the vicious landlords and eviction courts are literally on people's doorsteps waiting for midnight to bust down the door and put babies and grandmas in the street in the middle of a pandemic. It's murderous. They knew it was coming. This, this deadline has been on the books for since the last deadline. Pelosi said she didn't know and that she didn't have time to act. Last Thursday, President Biden pressed Congress to pass legislation that would extend the moratorium. They had to do it by Friday. He couldn't have asked on Monday? No, no, it had to be Thursday to provide some plausible deniability to Pelosi, who said, I didn't have enough time to whip up support. This is not even believable. I mean, how much whipping do you need to do anyway? The Dems have a majority. We're supposed to be the party of the people. You rely on these people to vote you into office, these particular people. I mean, how much whipping does there need to be to avoid millions of your own voters going homeless? This Thursday, Biden took the time in his little talk to remind everyone that his administration no longer had the power to extend the stopgap due to a decision by the Supreme Court. A little history. The moratorium was originally put in place by the CDC last year to, you know, try to slow the spread of COVID by not having people who all of a sudden didn't have jobs out in the streets getting and spreading COVID. Biden extended it several times to his credit, but someone took it to the Supreme Court because I guess they wanted a lot of people thrown out onto the street or they felt bad for the poor landlords who have to pay the voracious banks, who of course can't be forced to stop collecting mortgage payments. Can they? During a global crisis, let's think bigger, I think so. 
In June, the right-wing Supreme Court narrowly ruled to leave the CDC's moratorium in place, but it stipulated that any further extension of the moratorium would require an act of Congress, an act that would take a long time and allow for Republican obstructionism and all-around blame gaming, which we are seeing now. Biden says his hands are tied, Pelosi said she didn't see this coming, and BlackRock is laughing all the way to the bank. Yes, BlackRock, the financial giant who in 20, or excuse, yeah, 2008, during the housing market crash, bought up tens of thousands of foreclosed homes and doubled their profits. President Biden, by the way, and Vice President Harris both have BlackRock executives as their top economic advisors. Perhaps renters should join the Alabama coal miners in front of BlackRock, who brought their three-month strike to the BlackRock headquarters, which you're seeing bloodied here on our image section in New York City, because the company is profiting of treating miners like expendable slave labor. We covered that last week. We will cover it again in the future. But for now, suffice it to say about this eviction moratorium, no one did anything. Cori Bush's protest hit the press, then all of a sudden something got done. Biden extended the eviction moratorium, even though he is not sure if it's completely legal for him to do so, which I gotta say shows some spine, even though it was really up to Congress to do it. At least people will remain housed while someone takes the Biden administration to court and Congress gets back and has to face these issues themselves. But people still will have their houses while that is all unfolding. His move is expected to cover 90% of the renting population. Now, it has to be said here that many states have their own moratoriums in place. Blue states, mostly. I think New York goes to the end of August. The danger was mostly to people in red states whose elected officials, some of whom they elected themselves, wouldn't mind seeing them out in the street. Let's remember, by the way, that according to studies, Black and Hispanic people are routinely at higher risk for eviction. I'm just going to leave that right there on the table. and You can discuss it among yourselves or you can put some comments in the comments, which I do, in fact, read. Biden has talked about a whole of government effect, or excuse me, the effort to stem the ev- ev- evictions. This is it includes his $46 billion in emergency rental assistance, which was supposed to go to those most in need. Where are we with that? I learned right here on ACT TV, on this very YouTube channel, on the YouTube part, watching my colleagues' video report that only 12% of that money has been distributed. The rest, I guess, fell off the back of a truck or something. But moreover, one woman's action in this progressive news report, one woman's direct action from conviction is responsible today for millions of people being tucked in, snug in their beds this very night. Thank you, Cori Bush, for that act of conscience and everyone who showed solidarity with her. I'm Juliana Forlano. You're watching ACT TV. Don't forget to subscribe to us and share us with your friends. We'll be back on Friday.